Hello and welcome back to JBCTR. Now, as you can see behind me, we have the Mustang Mach-E, which is the first fully fledged EV we've had on JBCTR. So I really wanted to put it through its paces. And to do that, we're taking it on a family holiday down to Devon. And uh, I'll talk to you more about the mileage and the journey as we get on the road. But for now, let's get the car packed and get going. Yeah! join us on the M4 traveling west. Now we're actually staying in a place called Totnes, which is kind of like South Devon-ish. Um, and we're gonna get there by traveling west along the M4 and then dropping down. We've decided to put a, a small stop uh, around about Bath, Bristol area to give the car a little bit more juice, just so that when we arrive, the battery isn't totally depleted. And I must admit, on the motorway, this car is super comfortable you've got all of the toys you've got bliss you've got radar guided cruise control you've got lane keeping assist so it's really easy to drive but I have found one gripe and that is that the cruise control is linked to the speed sign recognition so it changes your speed automatically based on what the signs are saying the downside is is that sometimes it picks up a sign that is not meant for you and then it adjusts your speed when you're not expecting it so for example I went past a van with a speed limiter sticker on the back saying it was limited to 60 mile an hour or what have you i was in the outside lane doing 70 and the car suddenly locked up the anchors and slowed down to 60 which was not great so uh hopefully ford release uh over the air update for that fairly shortly but other than that it's been great and uh i will speak to you when we get there Okay, so first public charging experience was all right, actually. Um, unfortunately, all the superchargers were out of order or in use, so I couldn't get on a supercharger, but I did get on a normal charger, which has topped us up from 60% to 80%. But the downside is that there is a 90 minute maximum stay on the public chargers, so you have to come back to the car to move it to a normal space uh, before we can carry on our day. So uh, yeah, this is me moving the car. Okay, so stop two. We're now down to 29% battery, which means, well, it's actually quite a lot lower than I thought it was gonna be from that motorway journey. And I've come to a place with a supercharger and there's only one and it's currently in use. Dolt. So I've put my, I've hooked up to like a normal charger, which is not that fast, I don't think. And it's also eating into my 90 minute maximum stay here. So I have a horrible feeling we're gonna to have to go from this charger to another supercharger in the hope that we can get some juice ready for tomorrow. And literally just as I filmed that, by some miracle, the guys next door came, collected the car, left me with a supercharger, which means we've now got 80% in the next 40 minutes, which is epic use. And it means I can just go to our campsite or whatever and enjoy the evening. So yeah, hurrah. Okay, so as you can see, we have arrived. And before I go to bed and enjoy my evening, I wanted to run some numbers on the journey. So forgive the phone because there are a lot and I couldn't remember them all. So today we've done 240 miles, roughly, thereabouts. We charged at Bath on a slow charger, which cost us 11 pounds. 
We then charged again at Totnes, which cost us £19 and put us back to almost what we, lo what we left home with. So that's a total cost of approximately £30 compared to what it would have cost in a petrol car. So just to compare, a petrol car doing 240 miles, doing an average of 40 mpg at today's petrol price, which is about 172, would have cost about £46 for the same journey. So that's already a £15 saving. Now, again, if we factor in the fact that we were using public chargers, which are the most expensive, I think we were paying about 40 pence per kilowatt. If you can charge this at home, you can pay as little as seven pence per kilowatt, which would then make a journey like this significantly cheaper than a petrol car. So yeah, my first long journey in an EV has actually been quite a success, I would say, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. So tomorrow I'll tell you a little bit more about the car and why I quite like it actually. So uh, yeah, see you tomorrow. Okay, so what is it that we've got here? Well, it's a Mackie all four standard range. So four wheel drive and the standard range is claimed to be about 250 miles, but realistically, you'll probably get anywhere between 200 and 230 if you're using the one pedal driving mode, which I'll talk about more when we actually drive it. But yeah, quick look around the car. You get a few Mustang standardy things including the frunk, which seems to be quite an appealing factor of electric cars. And this can be opened either by pulling the bonnet latch or clicking within the infotainment system. But the infotainment thing will only work if the car is stationary, just FYI. If we move down the side, the doors are pretty funky. You press a button to open them and then the front doors have got this little handle thing that you can use to open and close them. The rears I have a slight issue with because same button but then you have to grab the paintwork to open it, which I don't really like considering these are probably gonna be used by kids with dirty hands and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, I quite like that. And if you move round to the back, obviously you have a boot. This one is a manually openable boot, but I believe on the newer all wheel drive Mustang mach -E's, these are sort of hands-free and you've got the electric boot and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so manual on this one with an adjustable boot floor which I've used for hiding all the cables because I find it easier to get them out of the boot than I do out of the front. And on the inside, Ford have done a brilliant job of making it feel nice and premium in here. So you've got materials that look nice on the face of it and actually this sort of fake carbon on here feels nice to touch. You've got a little bit of leather, there are some scratchy plastics, but they're like right down the bottom here, which day to day you probably wouldn't be touching anyway. And in, on the tech front, it just looks mega. You've got a 15 inch screen in the middle. You've got a 10 inch screen for the driver, which for some reason is in no way distracting. I was expecting this to be a real like off-putting experience, but actually it works quite well. The steering wheel itself is not actually as full of buttons as I was expecting it to be, I must admit but the layout is nice and simple, it's intuitive, and actually you can feel your way around all the buttons on, on the steering wheel without actually having to look, which is a nice design feature. As you'd expect with these screens everywhere, tech is vastly improved over nearly all other Fords I've been in. Um, this has wireless CarPlay, it also has a wireless charger for your phone, and that is, I know it sounds really silly, but it is so refreshing to get in a car, chuck the phone down there, and it just works, and it's, so much better than faffing around with cables. And with that, my hay fever is getting to me. So uh, let's go for a drive. Well, I've not had a particularly brilliant start this morning. As you can see, the glorious sunshine has disappeared and we now have some miserable British weather. And my main camera's also died, so GoPro quality it is. I do apologize about that. But on the mach -E, I was totally underwhelmed when I first got into this car. It's just not what I thought it was gonna be. Um, and I'm gonna put that down to the fact that I normally drive light, noisy, super nimble hot hatches. And this is not that. This is not light. It is not noisy. It's 
not really super nimble, although it's not bad, but we'll get onto that in a second. But after a while, I started to appreciate why this thing is so good. And now I kind of get it, I must admit. Now, one of the main reasons as to why you'd actually buy a mach -E is actually because of the driving experience. It's totally different to anything else I've ever driven, and I actually really like it. So the probably the biggest and most noticeable difference is the one pedal driving. So in short, you always have your foot on the accelerator, and then when you remove your foot off the accelerator, the car will slow down to a gradual stop. I say it's a little bit more than just normal engine braking, so you, it does actually replicate normal braking. And as such, you very rarely use the brakes but it does cause a slight issue with the brakes at the same time. So clearly there are times where you need to do an emergency stop or slow down a little bit quicker than the car is doing naturally. And for this, you use the brake pedal, which as you'd expect is an assisted braking setup as with all new cars nowadays. But the problem is your regen is already applying quite a lot of braking force to the car. So then you add on an assisted braking pedal and you really just have to tickle that pedal to get the car to slow down at a rate that I would deem acceptable. If any more than a tickle and you're going through the windscreen, like these brakes are proper sharp when compared with, or when combined with that regen. Handling, well, it's not light and nimble, that's for sure. This car weighs in at around about two tons on the nose thanks to that massive floor pan of batteries. But because the batteries are in the floor pan, it doesn't feel body rolly, it feels quite flat through the corners and it's just a really great place to be really. It doesn't feel like you're gonna tip over, it's nice. And when you really start to push into the corners, it handles it quite well. The only thing I would say is if you push it that little bit too hard, it goes straight into understeer and there is not really much notice before that happens. The power output of this car is pretty impressive. <laughs> it's so strange that it's silent. It's so weird. I mean, EVs as a whole will generally be super fast off the line and then they'll sort of the acceleration will sort of slow down a little bit as you get higher up the speed range. I was going to say rev range, but it's speed, I guess. But this car has so much power that even at 70 mile an hour, you can put your foot down and it will still accelerate at what is quite an acceptable pace. But clearly, most of the fun is to be had at less than 20 mile an hour. This thing takes off like a rocket. When it comes to driving modes, you've got three driving modes. You've got Whisper, you've got Active and Untamed mode. And I'm gonna be honest, the difference between the three is really quite subtle. I think Untamed mode, you get some fancy lines on your dash and all that kind of stuff. I think throttle response is perhaps a little bit more pokey and the regen may be a little bit stronger. But other than that, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between these modes, I must admit. And with that, I think the caravans are coming out to play, so uh, that's the end of our fun. And uh, I'm gonna do one final range test on seeing how efficiently we can get this thing back home. And there we have it. We are pretty much home. We're doing one final charge on a Tesla supercharger, which is kind of new. They're doing a pilot for any vehicle to use them. So I thought I would try it out. And so far it seems to be working all right. But before we end, I wanted to talk to you about the elephant in the room. And that is the fact that this is a Mustang. Is it a Mustang? Um, I don't really know. I mean, visually, clearly it takes a whole host of styling cues from the Mustang itself. And when you're driving it, you get to see the sort of haunched bonnet, which is very similar to being in a proper Mustang, for want of a better word. I mean, if you compare it to the traditional Mustang, this does kind of have similar performance, but the way it delivers that power is so very different. And of course, this is so much more practical than the original two. 
So uh, yeah, it's kind of like a homage to the original Mustang as opposed to a modern replica. And the other thing I wanted to talk to you about before we end this video is how much this entire journey cost. But unfortunately, the charging costs have not actually gone out of my bank account yet, so I'm not actually sure how much it's cost me. So fast forward a few days by the power of editing and uh, let me tell you. So the money has gone out and the results are in and I have my trusty phone to remind me of the numbers. So in total, we did 762 miles and I know it's not the thousand miles it says in the title, but that didn't sound quite as catchy. In total, it cost us 105 pounds and 82 pence in public charging. And remember, I didn't have any public charging memberships and I was not able to charge at home, mainly because we were away from home. So this is the most expensive prices you will pay for an EV. And in total, it costs us 13 pence per mile overall. Now again, if we compare that to our petrol or diesel car counterpart doing 40 mpg and paying 172 pence per litre, that comes in at about 148 pounds and 96 pence for the 762 miles. So that gives us a total of 19 pence per mile. So as you can see, the Mustang was considerably cheaper than any other petrol or diesel car and that is whilst paying the most expensive prices for charging too. So if you purchase a Mustang, you can expect your running costs to be significantly cheaper than petrol or diesel cars. And there we have it, a week with the electric Mustang Mach-E. And I must admit, I am much more sold on electric vehicles than I was previously. So I hope you guys find this useful. If you did, give it a thumbs up. And if you wanna see more of me, cars and that kind of stuff, feel free to subscribe and then I'll catch you in the next one.